If Oakland has a center, it's Lake Merritt. The lake is Oakland's central park. It also has features that are probably best compared to famous urban squares and plazas around the world. The lake draws hundreds of thousands of visitors every year. It has increasingly become a marketplace for artisans and entrepreneurs. For well over a hundred years, Lake Merritt has been the setting for history-making rallies civic events, and cultural festivals that have shaped Oakland's collective identity. In so many ways, the history of Lake Merritt encapsulates the history of Oakland. Knowing this, it wasn't a surprise to see that over the past year, two things strongly influenced how Oaklanders relate to Lake Merritt and to each other pandemic and protests for racial justice combined to make 2020 a year of conflict, transformation, and change. These forces played out in complicated ways at the lake. I'm Darwin Bond-Graham. I'm the news editor at the Oakland side. Over the past year, our reporters kept getting drawn to the lake to cover what was happening there. It was the scene of some of Oakland's biggest stories. During the pandemic, the lake drew enormous numbers of people seeking solace or a place to exercise. Partygoers flocked to the lake, looking for a safe place to socialize outdoors. For street vendors, it was a location to work and survive during hard economic times. Many people rediscovered Lake Merritt's natural beauty last year. Ringed by parks, it's a place to observe birds and other wildlife. None of this was without controversy. For many living around the lake, and for some park advocates, the past year saw an uptick in excessive noise litter, and concerns about public safety. There was a feeling that Lake Merritt was being loved too much and that the environment was being damaged. On the other hand, there's a disturbing history of exclusion and over-policing of certain groups in Oakland. After the 2018 Barbecue Becky incident, Black Oakland residents felt they had to push back against discrimination in public spaces, especially at the lake. I, I just looked they at it and it doesn't say anything. Drills in here. We wanted to revisit some of these issues, especially because Oakland residents have been working hard over the past year to find common ground and figure out how everyone can share the lake. First, I visited James Robinson to learn about the lake's history and its environment. James is the executive director of the Lake Merritt Institute. He knows more about the lake than probably anyone. As I was walking over, I noticed all this amazing wildlife. Has it always been this beautiful and pristine? Not always. Um, the lake used to be called uh, the Lake of a Thousand Smells. Uh, that's because all of the uh, things that used to be discarded into the lake, including um, you know, sewage and trash and things of that nature. So people's sewage from their houses would just run off into the lake? Yeah, it would, it would run right in here. But eventually the city got smart and started to understand it's not the proper place to discard your, your, your uh, waste and uh, found other more productive ways to uh, get rid of the waste. So although this is a wildlife refuge, and I think when a lot of people hear that, they think, you know, some distant place. Here we have a 140-acre wildlife refuge, and it's right in the middle of our city. When did it become a wildlife refuge? Yes, so um, it became a wildlife refuge in 1870, uh, when Samuel Merritt was the mayor of Oakland. 
and uh, it used to be hunting here. It's a lot of waterfowl here and um, people like to come here and, and shoot uh, birds and things like that. That wasn't particularly good for real estate or for people to come and enjoy themselves. So by uh, deeming this a wildlife refuge, uh, harming the birds and wildlife that live at Lake Mary became illegal. The lake has some really weird and strange and unique animals that live in it. You've been working on the lake for at least 15 years. What are some of the odd animals that you've seen come in from the bay and swimming around in the waters? Yeah, most people don't know that the lake is connected to the bay. And so it comes through via a channel that connects the bay and Lake Merritt. And so oftentimes we'll get fish and marine life that lives in the bay and ocean and Lake Merritt. Uh, some of the more elusive ones, such as uh, leopard sharks, uh, they're pretty small sharks, they're not like huge, and uh, bat rays, striped bass, um, pipefish, which are in the, the seahorse family, but they're kind of like long and they're not curly hmm. like the, uh, the typical uh, seahorse that you would see around. Um, so those are pretty interesting. Some of the rare birds that we have seasonal is like this forest of turn that is making noise right now. It's pretty cool bird it flows around the lake but also a very a bird that we don't see very often here often here is the great blue heron it's a very tall bird and it, it scours the lake it's a beautiful bird but uh, we don't see that as often it sounds like even though there's a wilderness here a lot of it depends on what people do to like maintain the health of that environment can you tell us about some of the like maintenance efforts yeah so we have aeration fountains around the lake and they oxygenate the water because sometimes in Lake Merritt we can have problems with uh, low dissolved oxygen and that can create problems for our marine environment and the ha inhabitants of the lake. Um, so we, we do that. Uh, we also organize volunteers to help remove uh, urban runoff and they come around weekly and we use our nets, gloves and trash barrels and we uh, clean out the, uh, the different types of uh, trash and things that we find in the lake uh, and this helps preserve the wildlife here because sometimes the uh, birds and other wildlife here can't distinguish the difference between trash and food and it could, it could prove uh, fatal for them. Um, a lot of people come to the lake and they have different sometimes conflicting visions about what the lake should be. Some people want it to be strictly a wildlife refuge. Some people want it to be an urban park where you can have large gatherings and events. What's your vision for what Lake Merritt should be? I believe that it's important to keep uh, it and honor it as a wildlife refuge. This protects the wildlife that, that live here and they can't advocate for themselves. So it's important for us as humans to advocate for them. And this is a healthy place. Um, hospitals around the country, even locally, are starting to see the health benefits of having open space for humans to come in and congregate. Um, the human aspect can be difficult yet rewarding because it, you, Lake Merritt is a place where everybody can come no matter race, economic background, uh, demographic, regardless you can come here. Of course there's some conflicts that need to be worked out but I think uh, in the long run it'll prove beneficial to have so many people here with so many diverse ideals about what we can do to preserve uh, this healthy habitat. Next, I met up with several biologists who study Lake Merritt. I asked them to show me some of the life that lives within the lake, creatures that a lot of people have never seen before. Much of what you're about to see was reported on last year by our contributor, Ali Markovich. What are polypes? So those are marine segmented worms. So it's basically, you know, worms that are in the water more or less. And this specific polychaete is from Japan. I can tell by the, the stripes and the shapes of it. So if we put it in here, I bet you it'll open up. One useful app that Damon uses to document some of these animals and plants is iNaturalist. If you ever want to spend a few hours looking at all the wonderful and strange things that lurk in Lake Merritt, check out iNaturalist. Okay, so what about? My off, my, I would put it there. Yeah. So dark, darker is better. Yeah. And it means there's more oxygen in the water. Yes. So why, why is that good? Well, um, just what many of the organisms that live in Lake Merritt get their energy by breaking down their food in their cells the same way we do, and that requires oxygen. 
So they, they, in fact, if there's not enough oxygen, you can have fish kills. And back in the day, when there was a lot of sewage and, um, and other stuff coming into the lake, there were fish kills. So that right there is a sea anemone. And I think this one might be from kind of Taiwan, Hong Kong area originally. Because a lot of the organisms from Lake Merritt, they're from all over the world. And they've kind of found their own equilibrium here with amongst organisms from all over the rest of the world. I have an interest in fungi and like I think around just the terrestrial environment here, I've found upwards of 100 species, which is really amazing for the center of a city. Um, and there, some of these things are things that I would have imagined I would have had gone to the tropics to see, like things that parasitize insects and stuff like that. But if you learn to look, it's all right here in Lake Merritt, which is pretty incredible. Actually, you know, wetlands, I think, are considered like the rainforests of the, you know, they have in diversity and productivity, they're right up there with um, rainforests. And, I mean, what a resource for people in Oakland who are interested in nature. So that's one of our tuberculate pear crabs. Mm blends in really well with the bottom of Lake Merritt. So usually I only see these if we're doing something like this, doing a pole. This has become an invasive species that we've now exported to Japan. Oh, so, okay, so a lot of the stuff we're looking at is from like Asia, like the Mediterranean, but we've also exported our stuff, our, yes. our life, okay. Yeah, it goes two ways. It goes two ways. <laughs> This is the natural history and ecology of the lake. It's damaged, partly repaired, still teeming with life, but nothing like the vibrant tidal estuary it once was. Now we're gonna look more closely at the social environment of the lake. When you walk around Lake Merritt, one thing that's obvious is how many different communities use the shoreline. There's an ever-changing map of activities and scenes around the lake. When the pandemic started last year, the east side of the lake in particular saw a dramatic increase in the number of visitors. Vendors set up by the dozens here to sell food, clothing, jewelry, books, plants, and more. Not everyone is happy about this. I live near Lake Merritt. Commercial vending, taking up green space, garbage dumping, unbearably loud amplified music, incessant drumming, dangerous driving the wrong way on one way, slow park streets do not benefit anyone's health and wellness, are not inclusive, not safe, do not encourage healthy youth activities, and do not support the vitality of the park. Nikki Fortunato Bass is the Oakland City Council President, and she represents District 2, which includes the eastern and southern shoreline of the lake. I met up with Councilmember Bass recently near Adams Point. So I've lived uh, in the area about 20 plus years since 1997. The lake, as everyone knows, is a gem for Oakland. Everyone comes here. It's right in between East and West Oakland. It's the perfect gathering spot for so many reasons, no matter what you're interested in. And when COVID hit, people wanted to still come outside, you know, get some fresh air, see people. And it was crowded. You know, there were concerns that people were not wearing masks or being socially distant. And so uh, the city definitely got, and my office got um, a number of uh, calls, emails, concerns about the crowding that was happening, as well as, you know, some of the ongoing concerns that we've heard throughout the years around illegal parking, traffic congestion, noise, and that type of thing. You know, even before the pandemic, as I was talking with folks vending at the lake, I was hearing about how they were vending on the street because they're priced out. They're not able to get a brick and mortar restaurant or a brick and mortar shop. And then when the pandemic hit, it was, um, you know, the same people trying to make a living and, um, you know, people who worked for tech companies who got laid off, um, people who worked for nursing homes that got shut down. Um, you know, I have met people repeatedly who've been vending at the lake, who've been unemployed since shelter in place in March and April. So literally a year of not having the employment they used to be able to count on and really struggling to make ends meet. 
and they're being creative by doing that at the lake. And then around August, um, Old School Copes, a uh, t-shirt vendor uh, for many, many decades here in Oakland started talking to me about, you know, can we create um, a place for vendors specifically uh, to have some economic opportunity during this crisis. And so it took several months, but we were able to work with the Parks and Rec Advisory Commission and get a pilot program permitted with the city of Oakland so that we could have for several months in the fall of last year, um, a vending pilot program that was pretty successful in organizing space for vendors to be able to make um, a living. Certainly the lake has received a lot of investment from the city, from you know voter approved bonds. One of the things I'm hearing loud and clear from parks users, from performers, from vendors is really wanting to have a place in each neighborhood, each district where people can come together. Um, you know, in another part of District 2, San Antonio Park, that park has been completely underinvested. That's also like one of the most violent police beats in all of Oakland. But that's also where the Malcolm X Jazz Festival has happened for years. And so, you know, working with amazing organizations like Eastside Arts Alliance, we could get not only that festival going again, but multiple music festivals and really provide programming from Defemory in West Oakland to Arroyo, uh, Arroyo Viejo in East Oakland and everywhere in between. And so that's the vision I want people to generate for the city. So we all work on that together. Um, because post-pandemic is a really important time for us to figure out how we use open um, outdoor space in a different way that meets not just our recreational needs, but also our needs around health and safety, the environment, um, and the economy, and art. So I'm really hoping that those type of creative ideas will come about over the next couple weeks, um, because we really need to shift and shift quickly how we, um, how we recover post-pandemic. That's the big question now. The pandemic is ending, but our collective love for Lake Merritt remains. What are we going to do now that it's safe to gather again and the summer is here? What's next for Lake Merritt? How will we mediate conflicts around space and activities in Oakland's favorite park while making sure everyone can enjoy it? There's lots of ways you can get involved with the volunteer groups, nonprofits, and city boards and commissions that are helping come up with answers to these questions. Probably the best place to start is by getting involved with the Parks and Rec Advisory Commission. This is the city board that helps set policies for how we invest in and use our city parks. PRAC meets every second Wednesday of the month at 4.30 p.m. There's more information on the city's website. And next time you're out at the lake, or any other park in Oakland, just remember, we're sharing these spaces with each other, and that's what makes them so special.